In this lesson, you are gonna learn about the console configuration and layout of the Behringer wing. I'm gonna talk about each one of these buttons and knobs and faders and what they do, and then I'm gonna talk about how I specifically laid out the console in a way that I think makes a lot of sense for mixing a standard worship band and a church. The first thing I wanna talk about with the console configuration is how to update the firmware. If you're watching this near the time of recording, this is a newer board, and so firmware updates are coming out frequently and uh, have bug fixes in them, so it's always good to make sure the firmware is updated. The first step in doing this is going to the setup, general, and then we want to set up the access to be OS. Next, we want to go to Behringer.com to their downloads here. So I'm going to go to this link, and then I'm going to search for the wing. So here we see the model of the wing, the type is software, and it's a wing firmware update, and it's version 1.12. So you can see here that we have version 1.10. So we're going to click update, and we don't have a drive in there yet. We have to first download this. So I'm going to download the wing firmware. I'm gonna save this to my desktop. So I've downloaded it. It's a zip file on my desktop. So I'm going to double click this. And then I'm going to look through the release notes here. You can go through and see what it is that has changed. So now what I'm going to do is open up this drive as well as this folder. And I'm just going to move over this .wingfw file to the drive. Once that's done, we can eject our hard drive. We'll plug it into this port on the front and we see that the firmware update is right there available. I'm gonna to touch it and I'm gonna click update and then the board will do its updating process. Are you sure that you wanna update the firmware? And it says do not switch off uh, and I'm gonna say yes. Perfect, our update is complete. It says please shut down and reboot. So I'm gonna press shut down from here, confirm. And then on the back of the console, there's this power button with the switch next to it. So I'm going to turn that off. It says eject the data USB drive on your PC. So I'm just going to pull this out and then restart the console. Now our wing has successfully been updated. If we go to our setup, we can see that the firmware is 1.12.5 and just previously you saw that it uh, was 1.10. So we know that our firmware has been updated. Hey, it's Jake. We'll get back to Adam's video in a moment, but first I wanted to tell you about the Mixing for Worship online course. The video you're watching right now is just one lesson of this course that has dozens of lessons on everything you need to know for building a professional mix for your worship ministry. Here's an inside look at the lessons in this course. You'll see that we have a whole module dedicated just to live sound reinforcement. It's really crucial to get your source capture right with the right microphone placement, understanding how to capture the best sound from guitars, keys, vocal microphones, communicator microphones, etc. And we even talk about speaker alignment and tuning your system. The next module is system and stage management, staying organized as a sound engineer. The third module is all about our mixing blueprint. So we're going to hop behind a mixing console. Now we have all these other foundational things in place, and then we'll walk you through our proven system for building a professional mix for worship. And then once we've covered the mixing blueprint, we dive into specific consoles, including the Behringer wing. So this lesson that you're watching right here is this one, the console configuration and layout. And you can see that we have an entire module just on the Behringer wing, as well as the Allen and Heath SQ series, as well as Behringer X32 and Midas M32 consoles. To enroll in mixing for worship, click the link below this video and we'll see you inside the training. 
As I've mentioned before, this console is completely configurable. So there are so many ways that you can go about doing this and I don't wanna get caught in the details or the weeds of uh, every single option and every single way to do this, but I am gonna show you uh, a lot of stuff on the board. I'm gonna show you how I've set it up. I've been mixing on this console at the church that I serve at for a while now. And I think I have a great idea of uh, how it is the best works to mix in a church. So uh, let's dive in. Let's begin with talking about the local inputs and outputs. I'm gonna walk around the side of the console so I can point to them for you and talk about uh, what is available on this soundboard. Okay, let's start with our inputs. You can see here that there are eight combo jacks. So these are XLR or quarter inch. You can plug either one in. A great use case for that would be something like a talkback microphone, or if you had microphones, uh, if you had wireless microphones and you had, say, a stack of um, wireless gear here, you could plug those into this spot locally. And then you have eight XLR outputs, and you could use those for, say, your broadcast mix if it was going, if you were mixing on the console your broadcast mix and then sending it physically to an ATEM switcher or something like that. And then you have your eight auxiliary inputs and eight auxiliary outputs. And that, again, quarter inch inputs, so you could use a computer or an iPod or something and plug those in there. And then we have a, it's just off of screen here, there's a lamp that is um, four pin, so <laughs> that's not something to plug an XLR into, that is for plugging a lamp in to light the top of your console, but it is LCD backlit, I don't know if that's really necessary. And then there is a uh, five pin MIDI input and output, and that will cover it for analog audio input and output. And then I wanna talk about our digital. So on the bottom here, you can see the first thing that we have are two ports for control and audio network. So you can plug this into your local area network and be able to control the mixer with an iPad, uh, the in-ears with an iPhone or tablet of some kind. And then there's also USB. This USB port can be plugged into a computer to access the data on the console as well as send 48 ins and 48 outs of digital audio, uh, which is something that the Behringer X32 is not capable of. Uh, previously, the, the USB port only did data. So it's great to be able to use this port for both. And then here we have the AES-50 ports. There are three of them. So you can send audio on AES-50A, B, or C, and you'd be able to send those to all of your stage boxes. Stereo Connect, or Stage Connect, uh, that is something that apparently is in the works, but there's not a lot of information on it as of now. Uh, it sounds like you'll be able to plug in a XLR cable and send 32 channels, uh, any combination of, you know, 16 in and 16 out or whatever. 16 channels can be sent over a single XLR cable, but I haven't seen any peripherals or stage boxes for that come out yet. Then we have our AES. Now, it's different than AES-50, AES slash EBU, you're in and out. And then we have a IO card, an option card. And in this one, we have a Dante card. You could also put a SD card recorder so that you could do your virtual sound checks just by using SD cards on the back. Uh, you could have a MADI card. There are other options, but uh, we have a Dante card in here so that we can send digital audio uh, not only through AES, but also through Dante. One thing I forgot to mention as far as analog inputs and outputs are there are two headphone jacks here. So there are quarter inch. Uh, there's one on this side as well. So there are, you can plug your headphones in and monitor things that way. So let's get to the actual console itself. I'm going to start with this section just because I never use it, and I don't think that a ton of people have found it super helpful, but just so you know that it's available, and uh, there are some things you can do here. This has all the channel strip details. So here we can see uh, if you select a specific channel, it's gonna have the name of it. It's gonna show you uh, the EQ, input, filter, the gate, comp, insert, um, where it's being sent to. You can see all of that on this mini LCD, 
but uh, I prefer just to select the channel and use the large LCD to see all of that. Um, so you can also use these buttons and knobs for different things. Um, so you can even turn on and off the EQ from here, but I've just found it way easier to select the channel and push the on off EQ for there or navigate through this way. So that's an option for you. You can do those things uh, on this smaller version of this screen, but generally I don't use that. If you're more familiar with having um, that kind of method where you select something and have knobs to adjust right away, that might be a better use for you, but uh, this is just another place where you can see all the information that's already on this larger screen. I suppose one helpful thing is that at a glance you can see the level gain reduction, all of the bus sends that it's going to, uh, although if you don't have them memorized, uh, it's probably not as helpful to know that this is going to bus 1 and bus 2, uh, whereas if you select the channel and then go to the bus section, all of the labels are there so you can see that it's going to the drums and the drum crush channel instead of just seeing that it's going to bus 1 and bus 2. You also can see the groups, DCAs, and mutes. So that pretty much covers this section of it. So now let's go back to the top left of the console. Here you have the USB and data section. So here you can plug in a USB flash drive. You can see it also says five volts and a thousand milliamps. So I guess uh, if you wanted to charge your phone, you could do that there as well. Underneath the USB audio and the data section, we have our monitoring and our talkback. So here you have a talkback knob, a level knob for your talkback. You can choose to talk to group A or to group B. So if you wanted to go to the setup section with your talkback A, uh, you would pull in which channel, uh, probably one of the local ones with an XLR to a microphone. And then if you knew you had your in-ears, your band was on buses 9 through 16, you could set up your talkback A to go to buses 9 through 16. But say you had the drummer, the music director, or worship leader on bus 16 and you specifically wanted to only talk to them, you could take it off of here and then talkback B would only go to the worship leader, the music director, etc. Uh, you can have the buttons be in different modes. So auto is if you hold it, um, then it is on until you let go. And then if you just press it once, it's on. So that is a combination of both the push and the latch. So push is it has to be you're touching it for it to go through. And then latch is you hit it and it's on. And then you hit it again and it's off. I probably would set these to push just because... Uh, it's easier to know that you they only can hear you. Your talkback is only going to their ears if you're holding the button down. Um, it would not be fun to have it in latch and then press it and be talking to them and then start another conversation and then say something mean about one of the musicians and they hear you. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I know you wouldn't do that. But um, it is distracting for the musicians to have the talkback in their ear when you're not trying to talk to them. So... Uh, I just recommend leaving that in push mode. Another option is if you were doing some kind of event where you were the MC or you had someone next to you and they had to make an announcement, you could have Talkback B go to the mains and then you'd have a microphone that uh, you just always be able to push and send it to the mains. So lots of different options there. And then we have our headphone level. So this is um, the volume of your headphones, so if you're soloing or cueing a specific channel or a mix, this is going to adjust uh, how much is going to your headphones. And then you also have a monitor level. If you're using this in a studio environment and you're using studio monitors, you can adjust that, set it to mono so that you can hear. Um, you can also have the monitoring go to uh, output A, B, or A and B. So tons of options there. Now that we've covered this section, let's go to the faders. So here we have a bank of four, four, four. So we have 12 faders on this section. 
And then on this section, we have two sets of four. So we have eight faders here, and then we have four faders on the right side. Each of these faders can be anything you want them to be, a channel input. Um, you could have a auxiliary, a bus, a DCA, a matrix. Uh, any of these faders can be any of those things. You even can set a fader to be a effects parameter. So um, just know that when you're setting up, any of these faders can be any of those things. And the way that they have these buttons laid out is they have 1 through 12, 13 through 24, 25 through 36, 37 through 40, as well as auxiliary inputs. Then you have your bus master. And then here, there are users where you can set it up to be however you want. But let me tell you a secret. All of these are users. All of these banks here can be anything that you want them to be. So what I like to do is have these stay 1 through 12, have these stay 13 through 24, 25 through 36, and these as 37 through aux, just so that I have all of the inputs on the fader bank somewhere, even if I'm not currently using them. So if I was to set up a mix and, uh, oh, we're not using any drums today, instead of just getting rid of them, um, I can always check to see if they're muted and the faders are down or some signals coming through the board and I'm not sure where. Uh, I just always wanna have each channel on the surface somewhere. So uh, I like to leave those as that, but you can have these be anything that you want them to be. And then uh, you also can bank over. So on certain banks here, uh, we have auxiliary inputs uh, but here on the bus master, we only have buses 1 through 12. There are 16 buses. So what you do is hit this over, and now you can see buses 5 through 16 because we banked over. So um, that might get you caught up if you're trying to figure out where is my other buses. Um, these buttons, this says 4. It moves it left to right in banks of 4. The same applies to this section of 8. Um, so here we have, this is set up to be more of your main mixes, your matrix mixes, and your bus mixes. So that's why the send on fader button is here. So if we were to go here, we have our DCAs, and you can set up your DCAs here. And then we have our main and our matrix section. So the first four are main one, two, and th one, two, three, and four. There are four main mixes. And then if you bank over, you can see matrix one through eight. So there are eight matrices. Here we have our auxiliary inputs. You can see I have auxiliary one set as pro presenter. So we could put, pull in an analog set of quarter inch cables from the pro presenter computer. And then we have our other auxiliaries. Here we have our bus master. So I have my buses preset up. It shows one through eight, but we can bank over and see all 16. And th this is where the sends on fader flip mode would be helpful. So if we want to change how much is coming into our drum verb, we can select that. And then as we go to our channels, we go to sends on fader, and we see that the kick, snares, toms are going to our drum reverb, and we can adjust how much is being sent to the drum reverb bus. And then we can get out of that and be mixing our mains again. Again, we have users one and users two. Uh, so you can set these to be whatever you'd like within your user one and user two for your mixes. But I recommend leaving the DCAs through the bus masters as they are because you have two banks that you can do whatever you want with. And it's nice to have these what they actually are in case you need to access them. Other than that, pretty standard on all the actual channel faders as far as selecting it, pulling it up on your screen as well as the side screen here and um, being able to solo that channel or mute that channel. So we've gone through this section of 12 and eight, and now let's get to our section of four. Again, we have some buttons on the side here. We have our main and matrix, so we can scroll through and see all of our mains and matrices. We have DCAs. We have our inputs, so if you wanted to always have your kick snare here, you could do that and then have users somewhere else. 
auxiliary inputs, bus masters, but I think that the power comes in setting up the users in whatever way is most applicable to you. Uh, I would probably set up my mains, my subs, uh, perhaps some sort of lobby mix if there was something like that. Uh, maybe the matrix mix so I can quickly solo it. And then having the pastor microphone just always available or a handheld always available. Just whatever it is that you are going to access most frequently, um, I like to use this section for. So that is all of the fader banks. Uh, let's look at this middle section here. So these are the custom controls and the DAW controls. You can set these up. Uh, if you hit view, you can choose. I chose this knob to be the number of delay repeats. If I wanted to have a section of a song, uh, have the delays repeat even longer. And then below that, I have the button set up as the tap tempo for the song, for the, the delay, rather. And then I have another set of custom controls. So you can have your custom controls, you know, these eight buttons and these four knobs, but then you can have a bunch of presets, 16 of them, I suppose. And I just like to keep this second bank where I have my main and alt flip, and we'll talk about that later in the virtual sound check section lesson. Uh, so that is this top half, the custom controls. And then on the bottom, we have our uh, DAW controls here. So if you wanted to see this, uh, you could have them be custom. I also have the main alt here, which is not necessarily necessary. So I can clear that and make sure that no one accidentally hits that in the middle of a service. Um, so you can have these be custom controls, but you also can have them be DAW buttons. So uh, you can set this up to control the record and playback of your virtual sound check. Or if you're using this to control a DAW in a studio situation, uh, the buttons would be available for that. These up and down, left and right, and scrub buttons also are for DAW control in a studio environment. You've already seen me interact with this, but uh, this is a touch screen, which is really nice. Um, I'm grateful for that. Uh, I've used this console and I go back to an X32 and I keep touching the screen, but it doesn't have one. So that's a note about how to interact with the console. So there we've covered the local inputs and outputs. Um, in all of the buttons and knobs and faders. So let's get to the screen and talk through our menus here. The home menu is going to be what you land on as you select a channel. And this shows you uh, the channel strip on the left side here. So on the left side of the screen, you can see that the way that the audio travels, it comes in on an input. So here you can select the icon and the color of the channel. I've chosen a kick drum, so it should look like that. And then you can choose the name of it. I've named it that. You can use tags, and we can get into that later, but um, basically you can add tags, kind of like hashtags, to each of these channels. And then as you build different buses, DCAs, etc., cetera, uh, you can just pull in all of the drums by choosing uh, the drum tag to add to that DCA bus or mix. So after you've named it and you've chosen the icon and the color and the tags, you can see the overview here. We have our low cut and high cut filters here. Uh, we There's a tilt EQ as well. And then we have our mains. You can see where it's being sent. And the solo bus is being sent to the headphones rather than the monitors. And then we have our level here, which is the same as our fader and solo and mute buttons as well. And then at the bottom, these knobs control the frequency of the high cut, low cut, trim, uh, the width, and the pan. So then our next section here, uh, this is our home, kind of the overview of it. And then uh, our input is going to be where it comes from. So here, if we had a stage box like AES50 plugged in, we could choose that it comes in on A1 and then we can choose if it's a stereo or a mono channel or a mid side channel even. Um, here, this is a mono channel, so we could choose that and hit close. I don't have an AES-50 stage box connected, so it's grayed out, but it allowed me to choose it. So you can set up this console without having stage boxes. 
Then the channel input has a main input as well as an alternative input. I've chosen to set up this console connected through USB to a computer to pull in all the individual channels for a virtual sound check. So I have my alternative input set as kick in. And on the input select, that's whether you want it to be manual or auto. So I'll give you an example. Um, here we have our main alt button. If I press this, all of the inputs are gonna come from USB rather than their main input. And I can toggle back and forth if I were to set the kick drum to manual, uh, it would not be affected by me pressing this button, flipping the main and alt, you can see that it stays. So that might be helpful if you're doing a virtual sound check, but there are certain channels that um, you don't record for your virtual sound check or you always want available, um, such as maybe your computer. If you're not gonna record the computer input, you can just leave it on manual, but that is what that manual auto button does. And we have our trim and balance. So you can balance how much goes to the left and the right. And then you have a trim that you can add or cut. Again, this shows our high cut and low cut filters. And then we can add delay. So an example of that is if you're trying to delay your snare to your overheads, if you are trying to delay a bus to go to a live stream, uh, and you can see it in feet, milliseconds, samples, or meters. And then this turns it on and off, and you can set the distance. Next on our channel strip, we have a gate. Here you can choose different gate models, and you can turn it on and off. Uh, you can select the accent and adjust that, which uh, I think uh, when I was listening to it didn't have a ton of impact. Uh, and I don't think it's in any manuals. So you can just play with that and, and hear what you hear and decide if you wanna use it or not. Uh, but here you can set the threshold. You can choose the ratio if it's a true gate or if it's um, set to one of these ratios. You can set the range of it attack, hold, and release. So that's a lot of parameters for a stock gate plugin. Uh, you also can set the key source, key source to itself or another channel. So if you were trying to compress the bass and trigger it with the kick drum, you'd be able to do that little trick. And then you can set the key filter to uh, different types, band pass, um, high pass, low pass, flat, and here I have it set so that the gate is triggered um, when it hears the 2.6K frequency. So I've, I found that that um, does the best job of triggering the gate and then keeping it closed when uh, other sounds come into the microphone, other frequencies. Next, we have our EQ. And then as you can see, this mock EQ came up. There are different options. So you can choose the wing EQ, which is probably the easiest to read and to see. Uh, and then you can go into these other modelers which are supposed to model uh, different analog EQs. So some of these can do different things and sound pretty cool, but um, for the most part, I'm sticking with the wing EQ. You can try different things and, and see what you see, um, hear what you hear, if you like it or not. One cool thing that I like about this EQ is having the band solo. So if you're listening to the kick drum and there's a frequency that you don't like, instead of having to gain it up and tighten up the cue and then sweep around and, and try and find the frequency that you don't like, and then it goes through the mains and it goes to the band's in-ears, you can leave this where it's at and just hit the band solo and then you can sweep this around and just hear that frequency, which is pretty cool. I haven't seen that on any other consoles before. I didn't mention this, but as you saw, anytime that I selected something, this knob here, uh, it, it does whatever you're choosing. So uh, that's something to note as well. So after our key EQ, we have our distressor. We have a compressor. Uh, this one specifically is modeled after a distressor but you can choose just the wing compressor, uh, an expander, uh, all of these, this Focusrite compressor, uh, an LA-2A. 
uh, another limiter leveling tube amplifier, and then this this wave designer, um, transient designer. So there are tons of options. This auto rider, which can be really helpful uh, if you've got a more dynamic speaker, like a, a pastor that that goes up and down, and you kind of want to keep the volume, but you don't want to over compress it. You can use a leveler, uh, this auto rider instead of a compressor, and so a drummer compressor. So tons of options here. Um, I like the distressor um, for drums, and for more transient instruments, um, but you can choose any of those compressors and have them in that slot, so you don't have to use up an insert to get a special compressor. You can just use the compressor slot on every single channel. We have another insert option, which is where you can choose any of the inserts here. Then we have another insert you can choose. So on our vocal here, we have a pitch correction. So that would be an example of using this insert that's not just a standard EQ or compression plugin. Then you have an option for a second insert. So you can use two inserts of special plugins on a single channel. Then after that, we have the routing section. This is choosing where it's going. So if you have the way that I have it set up, um, I have a bus here and I'm sending it to our broadcast mix because I want all of the drums the entire mix of the drums to go to the broadcast mix as well as the mains. But our vocal here, I don't have going to the mains because it is routed to the vocal bus and then that vocal bus is routed to the mains. So here there are four mains. So you have four stereo set of mains that you can send these out. So one of them I'm using for our subs, one of them I'm using for the actual main PA in the room, and then one of them is for the broadcast mix. So here you can set the levels, you can turn them on or off, you can have the width of it, so if you wanted to um, have a really wide keys, like if you wanted to, to spread that out, or if you wanted to make it mono or even backwards and, and flip the left and right, that's an option. And then you can also pan left to right, and then the level here is just the, the fader level. And again, you can do solo and mute from here or from the actual physical fader. So we're sending it to those mains, we're panning it and setting the solo, mute, fader level. And then lastly, we're sending it to specific buses. So here on the keys, we have the tap point. So we're choosing what is heard in the buses, what is heard in the reverbs, what is heard in the in-ears. We're choosing where that gets cut off. So an example of that would be our vocals. Uh, we're setting that. Uh, we could set that to be after the compressor so that they're hearing the compression on their vocals in their in-ears, but they're not hearing the pitch correction on their vocals. We also can set up a EQ specifically for the tap point. So if we had this tap point right after the preamp, we didn't want the vocalist to hear any compression or EQ or anything that's being done to their vocal, we could set up an EQ that is going to those buses. So here we can see all the places that this vocal is going. It's only going to the vocal group and the, does not have any to go here. We can send it to our vocal delay. We can send it to our vocal reverb. So this channel is going to these different places. If you had in-ears set up on bus 11 through 16, you could also use this spot to adjust how much is being sent to those buses. You also can come in here and choose if it's going to be a subgroup, if it's going to be pre or post fader. You also can choose the panning if you want it to be individual linked to the channel and set up the panning in this place as well. So that was a lot. I know that we only are on the first tab here. We hit home, uh, the actual home button, the physical button, and then there's also a 
digital button on the screen that says home, but that's everything that happens to a channel, where it comes from, how to label it, how to process it, and then how to send it out. Also on the screen, some things that we didn't cover yet. If we go to this first tab here, we can see the audio clock, the sync source, the input select. So these aren't linked to a specific channel, even though it says acoustic one on the top. These are just general settings that we can quickly access from this tab button at the top. We can choose all of these preferences, how the solos work, and then how the USB audio works. We can adjust the surface, the how bright the LCD is, the main LCD, the channel strips, the scribble strips, the backlights, the lamp, um, the buttons, metering, all these things you can control how bright or dim it's going to be. Then we can choose our main meter here where that's going to be sourced from. So say you wanted to always keep an eye on your stream, you could choose main one, or if you wanted to always see how much was going to the subs, you could choose main three. So I'm going to keep that on main four because that is our actual main mix. You also can have the main meter tap come um, pre, post, or auto. Um, you can set the fader speed. So that would be on an actual channel if it's going to be, if you're trying to have it go really precise or just standard. So if we get back to that. I can switch our fader speed to slow. And then if I go back to a channel, you can see that you can get a little more specific with it. With our tap flash, you can choose that to be off where you don't see it flash at all. You can have it eight times. So as you're tapping it, it'll just flash eight more times and then it will stop. Or you can have it be on all the time, which is what I would prefer so I can always see what tempo our delay is set to. And then with channel meterings, um, you can see the input that's coming in or you can see it after your fader. I would choose pre so that I know if the channel input is clipping or not, or if the gain is too low, I can always see what's coming into the console. You can do the same for bus meters, main meters, matrices, and DCAs. This first option here, I have show source on Scribble so that as I'm choosing something, um, I can see where it's coming from. And on here, on the kick in, you can see that it says A1. That's because it's coming on AES50A slot one. Another option is you can have the screen follow the channel strip. So if you're selecting this, um, it'll have the screen follow whatever you're selecting. Though it was doing that without me choosing that, you can still select it and then it will pull it up. Another option here that you might find helpful is to use F1 through three as custom controls. So now these buttons here can do customized things. You can choose what those would do. So now this is part of the user section. You also can have right section sends on fader. So the right section is here. I'm gonna leave that off because I like to use the custom or the main matrices mixes. Another option here is the show sends on freighter frame. Um, I honestly am not sure of what that does, but it did help me discover that if we go back to our surface and the fader speed is actually how fast the faders move. So if you have them on fast, if you have them on medium, or if you want them on slow, then it's probably a little bit quieter. Than the fast mode, but I'm going to leave it on fast. I want things to be moving fast because I mix fast. And then we'll go back to our surface selection here. And then it says double click to select home. So if you double tap a channel, it'll go to home. So say we are in the compressor of the kick out and we go to our kick in, it's going to stay on the compressor, but you can double tap it and it will take you to the home page. So I think that that mostly covers a lot of these 
Uh, a lot of these options aren't even in the wing manual, so we'll keep discovering them and, and sharing if we find if one of these settings is particularly helpful or not. Uh, but I don't want to get too deep into every single thing, especially when it's not even in the manual and it doesn't seem to make a huge difference. But if we discover something, we'll share it with you. We have our remote control. Here's where you would choose how to set up your console to be a MIDI remote control. I've done this uh, on this console at the church scene, um, on the church console scene, so that I can hit record and stop on Ableton, our multi-track audio software. So you can set that up here and make sure that all the network information is correct. And then here, the DAW mode is how you would choose um, the configuration if you wanted to have it um, in these different modes. And then you can choose presets. So if you're using Reaper or Pro Tools or uh, Ableton Live, I'm assuming Live, then you can load these and it will kind of have it preset for you to, to get going right away. So you can load that. Now these do different things. I'm going to turn the DAW enable off for now. And so that covers this tab. We can move on to our USB drive. If you had a USB drive in here and you had audio on it, you could play audio and stop audio and even record to it. And then here, this is just showing the, the Audinate logo to signify that we have a Dante card in the option slot. So moving right along to settings, this is going to change based on what menu you're in. So if you're in the home, um, you're going to have options for the RTA, if you're here uh, in the EQ, you're going to have different settings that you can adjust. And then in certain menus, you're also going to have the tools option. So here we're selected on the EQ, and we could copy this EQ from our kick drum, our kick in to our kick out if we wanted. And then we could hit copy, and it would copy over the EQ. We also could copy over the compressor, gate, the inserts, the fader level. Uh, you can choose all of those things and copy them over to another channel by using that tools menu. Uh, I'm going to close get out of that and not copy those settings over. And then finally we have the clock with the date. So that covers the screen when you're on the home menu. So our next button down is the effects tab. And in another lesson, we're gonna dive into uh, what all options are available for the premium effects and the standard effects. But this is where you could choose those and then um, route them and adjust all of the parameters for them. And then here we can just see all of the meters. So if I had audio coming into the console, you would see all the inputs all of the buses, the mains, the matrices, and auxes and DCAs, and what those are metering at. Here you can have the settings if you wanted to see the meters be pre or post for each of those sections. We have our routing tab, and again, this is going to be a separate lesson, so we'll get into that in the routing lesson. Our setup, we've already walked through this. Uh, we've gone through the different preferences. You can um, set the name of the console. This is Wing South Fellowship. It has a serial number. We did the firmware in this section as well. And then we have our on-screen faders resolution. So here, if we were to choose our kick in and go to home, um, we can have it be more precise by choosing fine. Also in the setup section with the preferences, we can confirm a snapshot load. If you're loading a snapshot and you want to have it say, are you sure? You can press that. Confirm library overwrite, I'd also have that on. And then uh, you could lock, you have to show the metering page when it's locked. So if you're at a festival or if you're having children run around or some, some reason that you'd want to lock the board but still be able to see the metering, you can have that selection. You can set the clock, set the date. You can also initialize the console and then wipe it clean if you wanted to build a new scene from scratch. And then this is also where you're going to safely shut down the console. So if I was going to be done for the day, I saved all my scenes, I can hit shut down, and it's going to 
uh, safely turn off phantom power and allow you to have a safer shutdown process than just the power button or unplugging the cable. Also within our setup menu, we can set up the audio, so the clock rate, sync source. We looked through some of these things earlier. Again, with the surface, uh, we've went through this. This is the same, this setup menu is the same as this button up here. So we've gone through all of these options already. And then our library, again, we're gonna do this in a separate lesson, so don't worry that I'm not diving deep into it now, but this is the place where you would choose to save and recall snapshots. So here we have Sunday services. You can see that we have dates for the last few Sundays, and then when we're done with them, we can put them in this archive folder here. But if I wanted to recall the scene, I could select it and hit load, and then it would pull up the scene for the previous Sunday. We also have folders for special services for church front, and then we do celebrate recovery at the church. So they have their own special scene that they can pull up and they only see a few vocals, the microphone and the mains and the computer. So those are the only faders they need and uh, they don't have a bunch of other things that they have to worry about. So those are snapshots that recall the entire console routing preamps, all of those things, but then we also have specific channels that we can save and recall. So on our bass guitar here, I could go into instruments and then I could pull up a bass guitar and I could choose all of the settings that I want to recall. So if I wanted to recall none of them except the EQ on it, I could load this and it would load just the EQ from this preset onto the bass channel or I could choose uh, the gate compressor EQ. I could choose all of those things and then load that onto this bass guitar channel and hit load there. And if I had one that I wanted to save, I would save it there. Again, we'll get into more of that in the other lesson. Uh, you can have effects presets as well as routing presets. Lastly, this button at the bottom for utility, again, is only available in certain menus in certain pages. So if we're on our effects, it's not going to work, but if we have a channel selected, then we can choose utility to copy and paste or initialize a channel. I know that that was a lot. Thanks for sticking with me through that, but that covers the console configuration, uh, the menus, all the things that are available on this board. And quickly before we end this lesson, I just wanna show you how I specifically have this laid out. We've covered a little bit, so this will be quick. So here we have the channels. We have kick in and out, snare top and bottom, toms, hi-hat, overheads, bass guitar, two acoustics, an open channel, electric guitar one, electric guitar two. These are both stereo as well as the keys one and keys two. Then we have the click track, three stereo channels for tracks, then we have vocals one through four. And I have three handhelds and a headset. And I just have these laid out in the way that makes sense to me. Uh, these are just the channels. But when I get to the user section, I can assign the channels to be however I want. So often on user two, I would choose the, all of the drums. This way, if I ever need to mix the drums, specifically if I want more snare top or snare bottom, toms, overheads, I can always go to user two and see all of the drums. But here, I would probably just choose the rest of the instruments. So my bass, my bass drive, say the band this weekend had two acoustic players, one electric player, a keys player, and then I'm going to have my tracks on user one over here, so probably won't pull those in there, but I would want to see all of my vocals. And since I have two open channels, uh, I'm gonna actually move these over. And I'm gonna put my kick in and my snare top here just so that I have them available. So here we have uh, the instruments and the vocals of the band and then all the drums and then on my user one on this side I'm going to hit view and then assign the channels. I'm going to pull in my buses 
I want my drums bus, which is all of the drums unaffected, the drums crush, which is parallel compression, all of the instruments, which has some bus compression on it as well. Uh, all of the tracks are routed to this. So if I wanted to adjust the overall volume of the tracks uh, between one, two, and three, I could do that here and then have the grouping of these three track channels in there. Then I wanna see my vocals. And then I always wanna have my vocal verb and delay available here. So I'd probably do that. And then on user two, I'm gonna put my other effects. So I can have my drum reverb and my instrument reverb. So my effects are always gonna be on these last two channels. And then here, I'm going to put the speaking microphones. So if during a certain section, a pastor comes up with the band is still playing, I can have user one up on this side and user two up on this side and adjust that. But I'm also going to use this custom section. So here for user one, I'm gonna always keep, assign that. I'm going to always have my subs and my mains on this section, as well as my broadcast feed. And then I wanna have a place that I can always trust that the computer is going to be there. So let's go to our channels and we have aux one set as pro presenter, so that will be there. And then on user two, I'm gonna always want my pastor and two of the handhelds that are most frequently used, as well as the computer. So now my computer is always going to be this channel, and then I'm gonna have access to the handhelds and the pastor. If I need to adjust the mains, I can get to user one and do it that way, but Pro Presenter is still this first channel. That's how I would use the user layouts and setup for mixing. This is very similar to what I do for the church on Sundays as well. With our user defined section, I'm not really doing much with it. I've already shown you that I have the amount of delay repeats available to me as well as the tap tempo there. And then on page two of these custom controls, I have the option to flip between the AES 50 or Dante inputs, whatever it may be, and then the alternative inputs, which is USB, so that when this is plugged into a computer and tracks are playing back, I can do a virtual sound check with the press of a button. So that covers the way that I would lay out this console for a regular worship ministry, and that concludes this lesson on console configuration and layout. Thanks for watching this lesson. I want to invite you to check out this entire online course called Mixing for Worship at Worship Ministry School. So just click the link below this video. You're going to get access to all of the lessons that have to do with sound reinforcement, stage management, our mixing blueprint, as well as console specific lessons on the Behringer Wing. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.